All right, guys, welcome to the Bourbon Hour. It is Wednesday night, July the 8th, 2020, and we already have quite a few guys already joined in here, so we're going to go ahead and get on topic. I've got uh, Thomas out there in Southern California. I got David, who is from Arkansas, but currently sitting in California. I got John out there in California. I got Steven sitting over in New Jersey, and I got Matt Cook, I think, is probably sitting in Southern Arkansas, if I'm correct. So, how's everybody doing this evening? Good. Doing good. Good, good, good. Another day. I hear you. Well, it is the bourbon hour, so I'm going to start with a little something different tonight. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's actually a, it's a pleasant surprise. I went to the liquor store, and I was like, you know, tonight I think I'm going to do like a bottle of Buffalo Trace. Well, apparently everybody has discovered Buffalo Trace and the shelf was completely empty. And I asked the guys like, where's all the Buffalo Trace? He's like, dude, as soon as we get it in, they clear it out. I'm like, okay, that's crazy. I was like, well, can you give me a recommendation on something else? I want to change it up tonight. And he gave me this title number 21. And it's actually quite tasty. And it rates like a 90 plus on the, on the tastings. So it is a good one. I've had a little bit of that. Yeah, and it's not expensive. I mean, it's a it's a twenty two dollar bottle, so it's not it's not pricey at all. So, yep, yep. So it's time to fill that glass. Well, I'm going a little bit lighter tonight. I'll just do the Corona. Well, you know what? I'm I'm not going to hate on you for taking it easy. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to shame anybody for not drinking bourbon. Oh, I I'm drink my the... share. <laughs> I'm doing a 2017 red blend from Hitching Post. Oh, no goose tonight? Wow. No, no goose. I actually haven't had goose in a couple of weeks. I've been uh, kind of on a Bombay Sapphire kick and then, uh, you know, a little bit of IPA too. I, I miss the Sapphire, but still to this day, when I get a whiff of gin, I get that little bit of queasiness. I had, a, I had a bad experience, you know, drank way too much gin in a very short amount of time. And it's one of the only blackout you know, throw your guts up experiences I've had never since I've not been able to, to stomach gin. Mm -hmm. And I used to love Sapphire. Yep, yep. All right, well, cheers and clink, clink. <laughs> All right, so what's new with you guys in the photography world? Don't everybody talk at once. Yeah, that's what I was <laughs> that's well, I, I, uh, I did get a chance to review the video from that last session and uh, got a lot of good tips out of it. I really appreciate the, the feedback on on that peer shot. Um, you know, there's there's just a lot of room to learn no matter how long you've been swinging a camera. Yeah, that, that's one of those things that I tell everybody. Once you get to that point where you think you know it all, you might as well just quit, you know? And that, when it comes to anything, there is always room to learn and improve on something. So. I saw your post earlier today, and I, I totally agree with uh, every every comment you made. You're always always trying to update yourself. You're always trying to learn something different. That's oh, absolutely. Yep, yep. And, you know, I'm, I, I think that's just kind of my personality to begin with, because even if I wasn't, you know, teaching or mentoring or anything else like that. I've always been a very inquisitive person, you know. I, I Once I, anything strikes a little bit of interest in me, I have to know everything about it, you know. So I think that's just my personality. But yeah, no, teaching definitely, I get a lot of benefit out of it. I mean, obviously, yeah, I get paid for it in certain scenarios, but also, I mean, even if I'm not, one, I enjoy seeing other people succeed and improve. But two, it also keeps me sharp because I have to stay up to date, not just on what I do day in and day out on my own, because I mean, that's just, you know, repetitive, you know, whatever you can do it with your eyes closed. But I have to stay up to date on a lot of other things because if somebody says, hey, how do I do this? Or how would you approach that? I need to be able to go, well, this is how you do it instead of, well, let me go Google it or YouTube it and find out, and then I'll come back to you. Because honestly, right. they can just go and do that themselves. You know? That's right. 
And, and I also like to stay up to date on, you know, what new techniques or new software or new anything, just so I'm in the know. So, yep, yep. But thanks, I appreciate that. Yep, yeah. And we got Boo. She's not quite connected yet. So we'll we'll say hi to her when her video pops up, if it pops up. Let me go ahead and get this screen shared here. Boom. There we go. Yep, yep. Yeah, that was that post was just me kind of. Hmm. I, I was having one of those moments of self-reflection <laughs> and that's what kind of sparked that that post and that was just on my personal facebook page that wasn't in any of the photography groups or on the mass yep. shot site that was just a, a post on my my personal facebook page but uh, that's right yeah yeah so i did make a uh a post on master the shots earlier today actually an article because i had started the business group on there to talk you know the business of photography and it's a it's a public group it's open to anybody that's on the master the shots platform you know there's no approval required you just go and click join and you have access to it and there's not much in there yet but i mean as people start to get on here that tends to be a, a hot subject because everybody wants to know how do i take my hobby to another level how do i make it a business how do i become a pro how do i you know market how do i price how do i this how do i that so i i started with an article as you can see it on the screen right here called pricing your photography and if you haven't seen it check it out i break it down so i mean it's not it's not extensive but it's enough information to get you started and get you profitable you know so yep so definitely well, check like, that out looks like melissa's visible hi hello hey boo <laughs> so how are you guys? good how are you pretty good i am almost done the bloody guy stuff <laughs> you're almost done oh, yeah no. i've been slow because i don't have got, got to move on to another project I already have one idea lined up. I just got to get people for it. And people in New Jersey are just like, don't get near me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you know. So it's not doing, like anybody will come like, and visit y'all. I've been doing like a picture because, day you know, just because. Yeah, your, your governor has like listed 37 states that aren't allowed to come to New Jersey without quarantine now or something like that. It's stupid. I'm literally hiking in freaking New York from now on. No, I hear you. I hear you. I went on a crazy hike the other day, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> okay. Yep, it is. I saw some crazy stuff. I even came across a, a tweaker cookhouse out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> wow. Damn. All right. You're going to have to message so me. That, that's that. a story for another time. Yep. And, and it was active. <laughs> It was oh, it was shit. kind of a on edge situation, but you know, I, I well, I'm glad you're safe. Quietly, you didn't take that as a photo op. <laughs> well, no, because you know, I just didn't want to stick around and give them any more opportunity to realize that somebody was there. All right. That happened to me uh, a few like weeks we ago. Jake has joined us, and we also have Jim has joined us. How are y'all doing this evening, guys? I'm doing all right, brother. Good, doing good. Great. Doing good. Good, good. Jim, you there? I am. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I, there I, I was talking. I, you know, I talked over you and didn't hear you. So. Cool, cool. How are you doing this evening? You're over. Where are you at? You're over towards the eastern side of Arkansas, right? Or you're down towards Little Rock. I can never keep it straight. I thought he was by like Park Texarkana or something like that. I don't know. Oh, maybe oh, me? I saw him posting something in one of the Memphis groups that I assumed he was in East Arkansas. I oh, am maybe. in East Arkansas. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Jonesboro, kind of oh, northeast. Okay. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's east. It's northish east. Yep. But for any of those that are into compasses, it's more like northeast east, or <laughs> yeah, whatever that is. You know. 
One of those marks right. in between. Oh. Not north northeast, but northeast east. Yeah. Okay. Man, what are you doing, Melissa? Sorry. <laughs> She's stretching out. <laughs> I'm on my. Uh, I'm on the couch that my landlord is normally on. Mm. So I'm very comfortable. Gotcha. He, I'm usually at the table in the dining room. So Jake, are you at home in Bentonville tonight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I hear you. Cool. So what's new with you guys that have just recently joined? Any fun things happening? Any projects or photography taking place? Absolutely none here, sadly. Yeah. I yep. I'm actually... Uh, um, no 4th of July photos? You know what? I almost went out to do fireworks photos on the 4th. And right? I, that, and then at the last moment, I was like, nah, I'm good. And then, <laughs> what I, and then from what I heard, the, the local fireworks show down at the Amp was just a total blah nothing. <laughs> So oh. I'm glad I didn't make the trip down there. You know, I was going to, and then I decided against it because my entire feed was fireworks, and I just didn't want to be part of that group. <laughs> I, I, I did post my my patriotic flag bikini shot, you know, just to, to represent for the day, but whatever. Right? Yeah, yeah, and I grabbed it. Oh, <laughs> I, I put him as the uh, as the cover cover shot for oh, our uh, photography that. group. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you hit the theme that I kept asking everybody for, and I hope that I can uh, kind of stimulate them a little bit. Yeah, you know what? We're going to talk about that offline about stimulating some uh, activity and engagement in that group because that group has potential it's just nobody is really stimulating it so, i um, i welcome it <laughs> yeah, what group I'm is actually, that i'm pulling that up right now arkansas photographers and models group ipmg yeah it's right here arkansas oh, yeah. photographers and model group there's a little That's over a thousand members in it so, uh, yeah. That's a great group. That's like the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, all, all of my Arkansas peeps on here, if you're not in there, go and check it out. So, any, of my, any of my Arkansas peeps that are checking out this recorded later on, go and check it out. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that, David. I, I got some, some ideas and stuff for you. So. All right. But yeah, the uh, flag bikini. There's my my patriotic boom. <laughs> oh, <Jenny laughs> <That's> my fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get it that down. Did anybody do anything that you can classify as Independence Day, patriotic, anything? Absolutely. I got a I got an awesome one. Okay. I'll send it to you on Messenger. All right, yeah, send it to me on Messenger. I'll pull it up. Actually, I have two awesome ones. Okay, I'll pull up two of them. I know that Stephen replied on the event, and I will pull that up here in a minute so we can talk about that because he posted his uh, product photography plus a behind-the-scenes shot of it, so we'll definitely check that out. In Arkansas. Oh, here we go. Oh, I actually saw this. That's actually cool. And, and we got your fire truck right there holding old glory. Yeah. Exactly. That's awesome. Hard to be more patriot. And that was shot all the way across the track mm -hmm. with my travel camera, my little tra my not not my big dog, but the little guy. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe how good that came out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yep, yep. That and I mean, any chance to show off your your fire truck? So I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't get me wrong. You know what? I've seen a few old pump trucks sitting on the side of the road over the years with for sale signs on them, and they're never expensive, yep. you know, like five thousand, four thousand, whatever. And every time yep. I see one, I'm like, you know, I should buy a fire truck. <laughs> well, now here's the deal. Because you almost have to think of this as an alternate universe. So you're buying a vehicle that has, they always have super low miles on it. Mine has oh, yeah. 2,000 miles. It's 51 years old. 
It's yep. been stored inside its entire life, been professionally cleaned and maintained constantly its entire life, mm -hmm. and I paid three grand for it. There you go. <laughs> I mean, and it gives you like <laughs> instant access to being like every parade and be the star of the show. And exactly. what year? What year is it? Uh, 60s? Is it um, early 60s? 1969. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. And yeah, that that was a that was a perfect capture of just going off in the background. And obviously, it was not a slow shutter speed because you don't have trails. You know, so the second, this was actually the relatively one, fast shutter speed looking at the fireworks themselves. Yeah, the second one was real slow at 1 15th because I was messing around trying mm -hmm. to figure out where the sweet spot was. And yeah. the first one was at 1 60th. I'll tell you what, whenever I did fireworks and I'd have to go and dig them out, uh, I found that <coughs> basically the one to two seconds was just about perfect for the mortars so that you got oh, yeah. the trail going up and you got the arms coming off as you know it expanded and so that one to two seconds was like the perfect you know for mortars so, wow that's now something like long. this where you've got all of these little sparks and stuff if you did that at one or two seconds, those would just be glowing arms that you wouldn't have all of the spark look to it. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I had absolutely no point of reference whatsoever on where to pick shutter speed at. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of kept guessing. I knew I didn't want to freeze it. Yeah. That, that I knew. Um, so I was kind of thinking of it like water when you shoot a waterfall or a river or something. Mm -hmm. I was kind of thinking in that realm. Yep. Yep, yep. And uh, the the timing on it, what I found to work best, and it also depends on how far you are from where they're actually being launched because, you know, you have to consider how fast sound travels. But where I was at, I was just across a, a small bay area. So I was, oh, probably about 500 yards from where they were being launched. And I I timed it down to where literally, like, as soon as I heard the boom from the actual launch, not the explosion, but the launch, I yep. would open my shutter for a one to two second, depending. And yep. that would catch the trail with a pretty good gap above the ground, you know, for that delay for, you know, because you've got the time, the sound coming to you, then you're hitting the shutter. So you would get clearance between the bottom of the tail and the ground, but then you would get the remainder yep. of the tail plus the explosion, you know, with all oh, yeah. the stuff coming off. So, so yeah, I, I would open the shutter right when I heard the, the boom from it launching, and it was a one to two second, just depending, and I would get, you know, get really good results yep. that way. And I was, like I said, I was about 500 yards from where they were launching. Another yep. really fun thing to do, um, if your camera has it, do the double exposure. Mm, yeah. Set it to like a half second yep. and uh, set that off. Hmm. Yep. I don't know if it does. But... Cool. All right. Well, since nobody else in here is patriotic, <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, just, just I was extremely gonna... busy. <laughs> it's all good. It's I all good. just didn't want to follow a trend. <laughs> I hear you. Well, yeah, that I shot honestly... that I showed you of mine is from two years ago, so whatever. I just keep recycling it each year. I was going to actually go out, but it? it was like I knew it was going to be crowded, even though they're telling everybody to stay home and all my spots were going to be full. So I'm just like, oh, mm -hmm. plus I had to stay home and protect the, the cats who were like, oh, oh yeah. Oh. I'll tell you what, though, I did see the videos coming from LA where they were videoing from like a helicopter or whatever and they were showing all of the fireworks going off around the city even though they were banned banned <laughs> yeah, no, it, yeah it, was, um, it was world war three in my house here. for like five five hours at least that's awesome they're right. banned out here and like there's a little river down the street um so i live right near the delaware so there's like a walking park with a huge field and all the neighbors like just bought illegal fireworks and just started lighting them off 
So like I had her <laughs> fire, they're like fireworks all night at that park for like two hours. Yeah, I don't know where people are getting them from now out here, but like I remember when I was a kid, like in Michigan, we would drive to Indiana to get the illegal fireworks, and <laughs> but they were just like you know they were kind of like piddly ass little fireworks. They weren't really anything all that great. And now it's like people are getting like professional ones that like yeah that's what was outside yeah they were like straight mortars <laughs> outside and I was like it's uh, close uh, not safe at all uh, until you they, they, get up they, they to like the one kilo they they pretty much opened it up to where you can get up to the one kilo without a pyrotechnics license <laughs> and I'll tell you what a kilo mortar is a big boy that's a big boy. Yep. It, it, it's very easy. You just go down to TJ and you can get quarter stick dyamite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't even have to go to TJ. Just go to the mining store here and anywhere. Yeah, there's a few places in Arkansas you can buy, still buy dynamite. Oh, yeah. No, I've, I've got a box of blasting caps in the barn still. Yeah, but this is California. So. Yeah, I mean, California has this wonderful thing called Vegas across the border. Yes. Oh. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, Nevada and Arizona are huge mining states, and you can go to any number of mining stores and get crates of explosives. <laughs> yeah, with, with a lot of documentation to go with it. But. Well, well uh, it depends on which store you go to and how well you grease their palm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want documentation, so that's why we just head south across the border and we get exactly. anything we want. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. To, John, to John's point, I had an uncle when I was growing up who worked at a demolition company, and uh, he would bring home quarter sticks of dynamite all the time. Mm -hmm. and that that is a lot of fun. <laughs> I remember Until somebody when blows their hand off, <laughs> especially when they're waterproof. Walk into Walmart. And you could buy the kegs of black powder for the black powder rifles, right? That's right. That's right. And you didn't even have to be 18. It didn't matter how old you were. So no. when I was like junior high, I would <laughs> ride my bike down to Walmart and buy several of the <clears throat> kegs of black powder. And I would drill holes in the top of them. And I actually put the, uh, you know, the electric rocket ignitions, you know, for the money. Uh -huh. I would put one of those in the top of it, and I would wire it to one of the little battery kitchen timers. And I would go out and <laughs> dig a hole out in the pasture, and I would bury it and <laughs> set the kitchen timer. And I was blasting huge holes out there. Okay, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stray from politically correct, but you sound like Omar the bomb maker. <laughs> hey, what are you talking about? They still do that up in in northern part of Arkansas and southern part of Missouri where you'd be walking into these fields and next thing you know you see these green plants <laughs> cans uh, nails, nails and rocks in there and a whole bunch of gunpowder oh man uh, I used to live I used to live in Grandin Missouri it's about 20 miles Mm. near Pocahontas Arkansas is so yep. and my yeah. grandma had a farm out there in the Ozarks mm. and, and stuff so so my uncle Quincy we used to walk through the woods and stuff and and we would come across where where a whole bunch of these these wacky tobacco plants were <laughs> and you know you, yeah, you can just farm. say it. you don't have to you know hint at what it is you know <laughs> cannabis marijuana whatever it is it marijuana is talk about Hey, I haven't had my edible yet. Oh, okay. well, have your edible, get in a better mood, chase it with some whiskey. You guys are bringing out my redneck side. Now I want to go listen to Copperhead Road and set booby traps all over. There you go. Oh, there you go. I love it. Yeah, I, I, I won't stay down this uh, path too long, but uh, my uncle was a, a black powder a distributor. Mm-hmm and a, uh, was the Glock representative for the Southeast United States for about 20 years. But wow. he got in with a bunch of guys out here in the West that were the custom pyrotechnic makers. And they bought a lot of his black powder supplies. Yep. He went to some shoots out in the middle of the desert around uh, Las Vegas that were just unbelievable. The timing and the complexity of the charges Mm -hmm. that they built 
and primarily used the black powder that he provided, and a lot of that came out of Mexico. And if that was back then, that was probably before they did all of the custom electric timed ignitions. That was probably all done by, okay, I know that this debt cord takes this long to run. I mean, this debt fuse takes yeah. this long to run. So I need to cut it at six inches so that it'll take this many seconds. Yeah. Oh, that was, that was no more than 15 years ago when he was active oh, okay. in that. They, and they, then they were already doing the they were doing it. boxes. Some of, these, some of these guys had nerves of steel, man. <laughs> Well, oh, you just... what, it takes a big set of cojones to work with a lot of <laughs> explosives and not be a little bit on edge. Oh, no, it doesn't. It, <laughs> explosives is fun. They are it's fun. Right? I'm just saying that you're, you're still a little bit on edge because you're, you're being cautious so you don't cause an issue. We, we, had a round, we had a round hang fire in a tank before. Oh, you, Lord. And you have to um, set a charge in there. And, and you have a master blaster. Well, <laughs> so, someone lost the master blaster. And so we're trying to figure out how to ignite powder that's inside the breach to unhang this thing. And here's this guy comes rolling up with this little um, gator. And so we're like, okay, let's start cutting off cords and stuff. And we, we actually hooked it up to the battery of the gator and, and arced it out. <laughs> and touched it up. It, it went out, round went out, it went down range, uh, <laughs> you, you know, because, you know, my previous life, I've played with a lot of explosives and, and a lot of stuff, so. But, yeah. Yeah, but see, you did it legally. You were doing it for the country. Yeah. That, <laughs> Hey, well, that, 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 big balls to do stuff like that. ATF has entered the chat. <laughs> but, well, you know, it, it only sucks. Good thing, see, I'm not, I was in a private. See, I had to private go down into the hole to at night. See, I'm smart. <laughs> I'm, I was an NCO. So, so I was like, all right, go ahead. Get down there, man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Boy. Oh, we, we, you should see, oh, uh, we had, um, EOD come out one time because we had another round hung in a Paladin, 155 round, so really big round hung in a Paladin, and and so they wanted to blast it out. Well, they when they they decided to blast out from the top and set out the breach. I don't know why, but hey, EOD sometimes they're a little stupid in the head, so, <laughs> so they blasted the round out from the top, which shot the round out of the back of the Paladin and landed on the ground. Now, you, you know, you have to set time rounds. You, there's a there's an actual wrench, a set time wrench. So this round blasted out of the back and, and then we're, we're standing there for about five, 10 minutes pondering if it's going to blow or not. So. And, and yeah. this is the bourbon hour where we start to drink and we get off on tangents. So I'm bringing it back to photography now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just letting him finish his story because I, I don't get me wrong, I enjoy the stories too. So <laughs> now we're gonna have to start a Monday night explosives hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, oh, nice <laughs> down. Monday night talk about weapons. Being explosives. There you go. Well, you know, the good news is so far I'm hanging in here and I haven't banged out a single time. <laughs> there you go. All right, so Stephen Buhler, you sent this picture. It is a couple sticks of lipstick, and I've got the behind the scenes as well. So you want to give us a little intro on this and why you shared it? Uh, this was just like an excuse to play with lighting. Okay. My front room. So it's three speed lights. Um, <laughs> that I got. Uh, I. Uh, I put them on some black acrylic, get the reflection happening. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was using white acrylic for the background and I was playing around with uh, lighting it from behind, from front using cardboard. And I tried to get some, uh, you know, some gradation in the lighting by using a grid and, with a gel and moving it around to see if I could get that going on. <coughs> so I was basically playing with reflections, the sides of the reflections where they were. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so I see that you obviously you're just using speed lights, and I see you've got this one right here with. 
some kind of flash bender on top of it, it appears. Yeah, and then a, are you shooting a, through some kind of scrim or something yeah, right here? That, that's a four by four scrim. Okay. That's what's giving the reflection on the one side. Yeah, that, that nice bright reflection right here. Yeah. And then we've got this speed light back here with another mod on it, which is firing at the background, it looks like. And it yeah. looks like you've got another one down below with the gel on it firing up at the backdrop. You've got pretty good eyes. The yeah. one with the gel is the one that's giving the purple uh, gr gradient. Gotcha. So the, the background itself, was it purple or yeah. um, is that color was, coming from this firing? Uh, the, most of the colors from the firing, but it was a light purple. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had to move the, the one with the gel around to get the gradient the way I really wanted it to across the, across the background. Gotcha. Um, what aperture were you shooting on this? Actually, what lens and aperture were you shooting on this? I was probably shooting around f8 or f11, and I was using a, a, a Nikon makes a 70 to 180 macro, mm -hmm. and so that was the lens. I was probably shooting around 100 millimeters. Gotcha. I was yeah, the only reason I ask is because I can see that right here, I mean, obviously the barrel of the lipstick is wider and is pretty much on plane with your lens right here. So this is what's actually in focus, but then as you get up to the lipstick, it's falling out of focus already. Yeah, you know, so, maybe this is a blend of two, yeah. I'll have to take a close look at this. That's good you pointed that out. Yeah, no, if I, if I zoom this into 100%, you can see that this is technically what's in focus. And then as I come up here, you can see it starts to get really soft edges and right. it's falling out of focus. So if it's a blend, you may want to go back and look and see what images you stacked. Right. See if you have a better image of the actual lipstick itself that you could could use in the stack in place of these. Right. I have to go back and look. Maybe I need to shoot it like F16 or 22 or something. Um, no, I wouldn't go like that. I mean, honestly, I would still keep it in that 9 to 11 range just because that's going to be your optimal focus on that lens and still approach it as a stacked shot just right. you know take a shot where you're getting this feature in focus take another shot where you're getting you know this in focus take a third shot where you're getting this in focus stack them and get you know your overall focal stack for the shot right uh the one thing i probably would have liked to see is if you had thrown maybe a small silver reflector like right off this side of your of your acrylic to throw just a little bounced highlight on this side of the cylinder you know down top to bottom just like this highlight goes here just yeah, you know a, a, like a small strip you know maybe a six inch wide strip of silver reflective material or something just to give you a thin highlight of this side of the cylinder and that would give you even more dimension and depth to each of those, you know? Yeah, that's a good idea. I'm, I'm gonna be playing around with this some more. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, I, I did I this it? tethered because there's- I don't have it on hand, but yeah, this I went to the craft store the other day. Well, actually several months ago, and I bought a whole <laughs> bunch of different kinds of reflective stuff. Yeah, over I got a bunch of those area, Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I've got silver somewhere else. But you can cut these out into little tiny reflectors whenever you're doing product photography. And then you just place them and it allows you to create like very intentional little highlights wherever you want, you know? So yeah, at the craft store in the scrapbooking area, you get all these custom like papers and like got gold reflective and silver reflective and all kinds of stuff for doing product <clears throat> photography. And they're inexpensive. I think I paid like 99 cents a piece for them. Cool. Yeah. So. so the speed lights don't have any, uh, obviously, modeling lights. So this is a process of, like, take a sh shot, look at it, move shit Oh, around. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Th this is where tethering really becomes a benefit because you can take the shot, just look over at your laptop, take That's the shot, you know, make an adjustment, take the shot, you know. That's what I did. Yep. I, I do like the background <laughs> and the gradient that you have on it. I probably would have moved this light over to camera right just a little bit more so the hot spot of your gradient was directly behind your product 
right. instead of off center to the left, you know? Yeah. Um, other than that, I mean, it's a fun experiment and it's a good, strong start. I love that you did it on black acrylic so you get that great mirror reflection in the foreground. That's really an interesting shot. That, yeah, that, that, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't know is when you want to get that perfect mirror look, you don't do it with a mirror and you don't do it with a pane of glass sitting on top of black or a pane of glass spray painted black on the bottom. You buy black acrylic. The reason is, is the pigmentation is all the way through the material. So the only reflective surface is the surface. A mirror or a sheet of glass with something dark underneath it, the light is going through the glass and bouncing back through. So you actually get a doubled reflection. And if you zoom in real close, you know, if I zoomed in, you know, real close down here, you would actually see a little bit of doubling along all of the edges in the reflection if this was done on a mirror or a pane of glass with something dark underneath it. So if you are going to get into this reflective thing, buying a sheet of black acrylic is a must because it gives you this perfect reflection. Yep, yep. Cool, anybody else got anything they wanna say on this shot? I know I kind of just jumped on it and everything, but everybody oh, has a that. everybody I has a voice here, so. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I really like it. The only thing I've noticed is like part of the rim of the lipstick is showing. Um, personally, I'd clone that out. Um, but other than that, I like it. I don't really, that's just nitpicking, but. Because the one has like it not showing and the other one does. So I feel like maybe cloning in another rim or just taking that rim out just so it's consistent. I'm not sure. What rim are you talking about? This is the plastic left rim on the left stick. The rim at the top. The stick at the red Yeah, Or the base of the lipstick, the little thing that. Puts yeah. It out. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that'd be a pretty easy fix. Yeah, it's not hard. It's just, um, it's just consistency, I guess. Um, because I like the shot. Otherwise, it's really well executed, and I like the lighting. So, and I, it has enough magenta. So, are uh, you sure about that? I mean, Mark's <laughs> not in here, so we can't accurately decide if there's enough magenta. I, I, I agree with Melissa on everything. I love the shot too, and I'm a sucker for magenta and purple, so I really love it. Um, I think it could have a brand name under it and be hanging in Macy's tomorrow. There you go. Yeah, I, I, I the, agree. The one the thing, quality is good. I think the one thing, um, and I think, uh, Josh, when you said the reflector would probably fix it, but the name brand, um, you know, down below, you can't actually make out the name brand. And I think in camera, you could do that. Yeah, possibly with reflector, possibly with pose. To... I think that really would have been a nice touch, you know, if this was just, you know, a product shoe. Is get that name brand sticking out right there at that bottom metallic edge. Mm -hmm. But, you know. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I I kind of wish if it was focus stack and the um the one in the the lipstick in the with the black was twisted a little bit and and if it was it was focus stack so you can have the rim on one end and the and the male on the other end to and, and plus it'll add a little bit depth to it because you're making one one of the lipsticks a little bit smaller as you rotate it down to line it up and it would have this it, it would have this um like a depth to it because on distance and then it will show the name Especially focus stacking it from from one one end of it all the way to the very last end of the, yeah. of the lipstick. So I got rid of that little plastic rim for you, Melissa. It's good. But yeah, no. And the other thing is, now I know good. that you wanted to get the R with the crown on it right there in that highlight. But I think that you would also want to turn it so that you got the full brand name. So that's another consideration where you might go, okay, well, 
maybe I turn them so that I get the full brand visible. Or if it's not visible, you know, completely, maybe have part, you know, this part of it visible on this one, and then the other one turned to where you can see the rest of it on the following one, because maybe the brand name wraps around 180 degrees, so there's no way to turn it to get it all. But get it to where you can see the full brand, and then maybe think of some kind of snoot to take a shot where you are illuminating just this area right here. So you can go in and maybe stack that into your stack as well, and then just reveal that illumination so that it draws your eye to that brand or that logo. Mm -hmm. Because that's the whole purpose of a product shot is to advertise a product and the brand that's providing that product, you know? So. Good. I'll uh, be incorporating all this in the next attempt. Yep, yep. But yeah, I would definitely like to see like a second, a secondary highlight down this other side because that would give you even more dimension <laughs> to that cylinder shape. Very cool though. I like it. I do like it. I think I sent you another one of a, another shot of I just sent I just sent you another shot one of Alyssa done at uh, the studio. Uh, which I'm not sure if it posted yet. It to me on? Uh, I think I posted it to the group, but I'm not. <clears throat> Ooh, hey Thomas, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh, cool. uh, yeah. You I posted it to the group. You said which group? Yeah, Facebook right or the Master of the Shots? Uh, Master of the Shots. It should be right underneath the lipstick photos. Oh, you posted it on the event. Yeah. Gotcha. There we go. Got it. So this was just done with a uh, yeah, yeah, beauty dish with a grid on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the really dark black and white moody noir type lighting. <coughs> that, that takes me back to the 60s and 70s when I first got into this. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to give somebody else option first dibs on talking about this shot. Who wants to go? Not everybody at once. I'll start. Yeah. Go for it. Um, I like the shot. I like the mood of it, the pose. Um, I like the post processing. I would... Although I see what you're going for with getting the um, frame much darker on the left-hand side of the image, I might like to see a little bit more detail, especially in the hair. Um, so like maybe just a, a little, uh, what do you call that, rim light in the, uh, in the background to light up her hair. But um, other than that, yeah, I love it. I actually disagree. I like how it fades off to the blackness. However, I don't like the crop. Like, I either feel like it should be uh, a portrait where she's centered or black added to where, you know, she's off to the right. Um, you know, kind of coming out of the, the darkness, I guess. Yeah, this, this looks like one of those where you break that rule of thirds. Uh, you break it, but you break it subtly. Yeah. Not, so what not, I'm doing right here completely. is I did bring it in and got rid yeah. of the off center a bit, but I'm breaking and not breaking at the same time. What you'll see that I've done here is I've actually landed an anchor right there in the shoulder. Yep. I've got a third that cuts right across the waist, and I've got a third that runs straight down through this shoulder and right down through that hip and thigh. So it's anchoring her all within that shot, you know? So you can see how many things are anchored and fall on all of the thirds within this shot just by doing that. So if I commit to that, you see? 
Okay, you've broken it, but she's like coming out of the shadow, so exactly. it looks good how you you know you crop that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't crop it a lot. I mean, I cropped it maybe five, somewhere between five and ten percent, maybe. It is amazing how much just a little bit of crop. Oh yeah, completely it changes the way an image yeah. it comes across to you. Right. Who else wants to comment? Come on, people. I I agree with the shadow on our left, her right. That I'd like to see just a little more light on her neck. It looks like it looks like her head is floating above her body, and that just bugs me. What device are you watching uh, this on? Uh, my phone. Yeah, that's <laughs> probably part of the problem. Really yeah, dark. I'm actually driving. looking on it, and I don't see her head floating. I mean, I see plenty of detail and features all through this whole area. Gotcha. So that, that may be the device you're currently watching on. I mean, the what darkest it, shadow there is is actually this transition right along her jawline. There yep. is a hard, dark shadow right there, but it's not black. And there is uh, a hard, it, dark shadow right here, but again, it's not black. It is interesting how defining that line is along her jawline. Uh, that that shadow is just... Here, let yeah, me zoom in for you. See, see that, Jim? That... That there's a lot of a lot of definition there. Mm -hmm. Not now that you zoomed in, I would get rid of the. Uh, I know she doesn't probably have a double chin, but you know that line right below her chin. Yeah, a little dimpleish area right here. Yeah, I'd get rid of that for yeah. sure. I like it because it's actually a very raw edit. I know Alyssa personally, and she has amazing complexion to be with. <laughs> I mean, she rarely ever has more than just one or two little blemishes that are nothing like this. I mean, I would be completely, if you told me that there's no retouching done to this at all, I would 100% believe you just because well, I know her personally. Yeah, I mean, it's unretouched, that's for sure. There you go. So, yep. I do like the light overhead like that. The, I mean, it's kind of classic glamour lighting with the triangle under the nose. Mm -hmm. shooting up at the angle it's it is yeah, if, I, if what you did her face forward you definitely would have gotten the butterfly in the full size image it's not that noticeable but when you zoomed in i did find myself distracted by this stud in her nose oh yeah just right there but you don't notice that at the full size yeah in, in the full size you don't really see it it's not a big deal yeah, that, that, yeah, that definitely feeds great. into that yeah, whole thing good. that, you know what, you really need to zoom out and view it as it's intended to be viewed to decide whether or not it's an issue you need to address. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Perspective. Well, there's a straight hair off to the right, too. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, that's um, that's <laughs> dying, eyes, and eyes. So is this Alyssa? Yeah, that's Alyssa Caruso. Oh. Wait just a second. I'm letting Lisa in. There we go. All right. All right. Who else? Anybody? Who have we missed? Mm. Hi, Lisa. How are you? You know, the only comment I had for this. You, have, you have to turn yourself off mute if you're going to talk. I see your mouth moving. <laughs> not you. Not you, Melissa. Lisa. Sorry. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Melissa, what were you saying? Uh, the only issue I had with the shot was the crop, and you fixed it. So. Cool. I really like this shot, Stephen. I love how deep the shadow, the blackness is, and how she just kind of dissolves out of it. I mean, you don't see a definitive edge anywhere, with the exception of right there on that shoulder, but whatever. I love how the back <clears throat> of the arm just melts out of the shadow. I love how the fringe on the jean, the jean shorts just melts out of the shadow. She just is slowly emerging out of the shadow. You can't tell where she begins and the shadow begins, you know? I, I love that. Well, hey, all your workshops paid off. I'll give you a shameless plug. Oh, thanks. Appreciate <laughs> it. Appreciate it. Uh, 
I like the shot. I, I mean, I there's a lot that I like about this shot. Obviously, the lighting's excellent. Um, I like that you left it raw. You haven't retouched her, you know? It, it that really was a, adds a lot to it, especially in black and white, you know? And that was a beauty dish Real. with a grid. That's, yeah. Yep. That's it. Okay. Um, I also to have to give a list of props on the outfit because the outfit works for this lighting. I love that she's got this like ribbed cotton <clears throat> top that she's twisted, which gives you all of these interesting folds and contrast in your lighting. I love that she's got these cut off jeans that has all of this fraying that adds to, you know, with that or with the, the lighting that you've got. There's a lot of interest going on throughout this whole image. It's not just a pretty face, a pretty portrait. I mean, it's it's moody and it pops out at you. I mean, I, I really like this image. It's strong. And I mean, my only my only thing was the crop. I agreed with John and Jake and everybody on the crop, and that's why I cropped it in. Other than that, there's not really much I would change about this shot. <laughs> yep, yep. Hey, what is lens that a is use on this? Oh. Um, I was using Go ahead. A, I was using a, a uh, Nikon 10514. Oh, okay. I was just curious. Somebody else tried um, to speak appeared. over Jake. I didn't try to speak over him. We just spoke at the same time. Well, you should speak um, over him. <laughs> <laughs> this appears to be a single <laughs> light source. <laughs> Go ahead, it's a, beauty, it's a beauty dish with the grid overhead. Okay. So and just one about, light source. She's about, I'd say, six or seven feet from a black background. I like it. It's very, it's a very strong image. Was this a 45-45? Or I'm just wondering about setup, I guess. Oh, well, the beauty dish was probably about, it was almost pointed, it was pointed fairly straight down and uh, probably about seven feet above, uh, above the ground. You, you were doing a Claussen's approach to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically he just had her kind of step into the light as it's falling off hard. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, at, whenever you do a beauty dish overhead, first off, it's a very direct hard light from any distance. So if you've got it that high, you've got a very direct hard light to begin with. Then you throw a grid on it to really just bring it in. So you really, you, you set that up and then you just have them slowly move forward until they just get into the edge of it, the fringing of it, and you get this kind of lighting. It's, it's a great, it's a great technique. It's kind of soft but hard and dynamic at the same time, you know? And great for black and white. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I spent a lot of time moving around in the edge of the light to get her in the right place. Yep. You did, you did a good job of that. Yep, yep. I also like that you got a really nice <laughs> fall off because obviously, you know, inverse square law, You've got the light source overhead. So it's at seven feet and she's about five two. So it's really about two and a half feet, almost three feet off the top of her head. So at that distance, she's still close enough to the light source that there's a pretty decent fall off by the time you get down to her thigh, you know? And I mean, with inverse square law, the further your subject is from the light source, the slower, the, the less the light falls off with distance. So, I mean, if you had that light another couple feet up, then the overall lighting from forehead to thigh, there would be less fall off because, you know, for the same exposure, because the light source would be further from her. <clears throat> Does that make sense to y'all? Does to me. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So having the light source closer to her creates more fall off in the exposure from here to here. And if he had said cranked it up to 12 feet and then adjusted the power outage to get the exposure he wanted, she would have had a more uniform exposure from here to here because she was much further from the light source. So, and one thing I'm 
I'm just now noticing, and it may be either my device or the JPEG conversion. There's a little bit of a, a lighter shadow kind of blending out, uh, especially behind or a little bit in front of Do you see that? Yeah, I see one too. I think what you're talking about in the black, where it kind of looks a little blocky, like surrounding her. That's probably the yeah. JPEG. Yeah, it's probably just the JPEG compression. Okay. <clears throat> That's what I assume, but. Yeah, I mean, I see a little bit of noisy something happening back here, but I think that that's the JPEG compression. That's not the, yeah. Oh, cool, though. Very cool shot. I mean. That's a great shot. I love this shot. There's a I love how it brings out a clean up and a retouch, and I mean, obviously, it's up to you to clean up, you know, a couple little blemishes or the cleft in the chin underneath or wrinkles in the neck or whatever. What I might actually clean up is some of the really brighter uh, flyaways, like this one that's sticking out right here. I might get rid of that one. And oh, I might get rid of like this one little spot right here because that actually looks like a split in that's just shining at you, you know. So I might get rid that of that, but I wouldn't clean it up perfectly. I would leave some of it to give that still raw, but just some of the ones that really jump out at you, I might get rid of. What about the thumbnail? Would you do anything with that? The thumbnail. What did I miss on the thumbnail? I'm just curious. It's just really bright. I was just curious. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything is so matte and neutral or mid-tone. I might bring down that highlight. I wouldn't get rid of it because then you're just going to end up flattening out the nail. But I might tone it down a little bit, you know, just knock the edge off of it. Because that really is the only bright highlight below her shoulders, you know. This reminds me a lot of like the old um, uh, guest jeans ads. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. From, like, from back in the day, a lot of them were very black and white and had this kind of feel to them. Mm-hmm. Yep. Cool, cool. All right. All right. We got very nice oh, yeah, we got something from Thomas in the group. Yeah, I just, I mean, if you guys want to talk about it, we can. I threw up five shots of uh, the recent Amboy trip. It's kind of a continuation of um, uh, last week's Bourbon Hour. Cool. And there's a, there's a trick inside these five shots. There is one photo out of this series of five that is straight out of camera raw. And uh, you guys all have to guess which one that it is. All right, I'll go through <laughs> them slow. We'll start with the cafe shot. Edited. Well, don't speak up yet. We're just, I'm just gonna give you all like Ow. three or four seconds on each shot and then afterwards we'll take a vote. So we're gonna say this is shot A, this will be shot B, shot C, shot D, and shot E. So we got A, B, C, D, and E. Right? All right. So we just chat? Well, I'll say which one I think it is. I think it's D. I think it's that interior shot through the door frames. I know it's D. <laughs> well, I don't know it's D. I guess I shouldn't say that. I think You're it's D. confident that it's D as well. <clears throat> What's everybody else think? I'm going to say E. E, so the, the neon sign? Yeah. yeah I'm going to say E too. Gonna vote for that that would be my second guess, but I'm really kind of feeling this one. I kind of think that it's it's the door frame. I think it's D. I think it's B because why would you leave flies on the corner of the? Because it makes it feel car. like it's been driven down the road. And not bump up the shadows to bring the grill out. Right. I kind of thought I thought B also. I didn't. I thought about B until I saw C and the the color matching and everything. I mean, you can do that, of course, but 
I, I feel like there is some color grading happening with A, B, and C. That's why I immediately started thinking D and E. And in D and E, I feel like E, I would Tops. be more likely to try and enhance some stuff in this shot and leave this one untouched and just raw. Yep. Wow, this is a lot more fun than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. well, I, think everybody's, I think everybody has voted. So which one is it, Thomas? You're correct. It is D. All right. Cool. <laughs> and I actually didn't notice that until I was exporting out of Lightroom just now. And I'm just like, oh, shit, I haven't even touched this file yet. <laughs> it's all right. It's a very like, cool I'm gonna shot. A, I'm going to play a game on these guys. <laughs> yep. Very cool shot. So that's, uh, I think it was you, David, and I think Jacob guessed uh, yep. D. Yep. yep. All right. Do I win something? You Do I get some ice cream? You win, <laughs> for, you win gold stars for the day. You, you get a bottle of goose next time you're in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. The great series of shots, though. Especially, I mean, do you have a third shot of the car? Yeah, I do. Cool, because that would be one of those that I would do like a three-shot series of the car for, okay. you know, prints or something. Yeah, I've actually got, I think, uh, five or six shots of oh, the car. Oh, then, you know, don't stop at three. I mean, do more than three, but yeah. I, I like that it's just detail shots. Here, you've got the steering wheel and the dash and the curvature of the, of the windshield and the missing mirror. Here, you've got you know the cool curvature of the quarter panel and the headlights and the marker lamp and the grill they're all detail shots and none of them are the entire car and if you have you know three four five different detail shots of different pieces of the car that you can do as a series that's awesome mm -hmm. yeah that's kind of what i was thinking um this is the first time i've been there when the car's been out there and uh, yeah, I wanted to make sure I got in and got some good detail shots. I'm gonna probably do some more when I go back. Yeah, that is awesome. Now, I also, I also, whoa, what's happening there? Oh, I, is I was just blue? Guessing. There we go. Oh. I had hey, selected if you, somehow. If you do go back, um, if, I mean, just, for my curiosity's sake, I guess, uh, try um, a wider focal length, like somewhere between 20 to 14. I just mm -hmm. kind of want to see what that car looks like. With He uh, wants to know if his Sigma 21.4 is going to make it look badass. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think I like that. And Jake, it will. No, you know, no, Jacob, they... um, I did this whole thing with my uh, 28 to 75 on my A7R3. Every shot I took that day was on that lens. And it's a bummer, too, because after I got home, I had brought my uh, 12 to 24 Sony with me, which is an awesome sharp lens. But, like, I was just so excited to go around and shoot. It's like I had that thing where I didn't even think of switching lenses. So when I go back, I'm definitely going to do some more wide-angle stuff. Sweet, sweet. I want to see that. Where is that located? This is in Amboy, California, right off of uh, Route 66. Okay. And that's actually at the bottom of the sign. That's the full car. Mm -hmm. well, the, back, okay. the back end of the full car. I would actually include that in a series, but maybe get a daytime shot of it with the, without the neon, you know, so that it actually matched your, your lighting and color grading. Yeah, kind of the cool blue tones of yeah. the, other, the other shots, yeah. That, that's one of the other things I really love is that you've got this nice baby blue, then you've got this seafoam green, but then you've got the warm oranges of the desert in the sun back here, which is complementary of those greens and tealish blues in the foreground. So the color, the color uh, palette here really works. Same here. Yep, the yep. detail of the back of that seat being pretty much ripped out with the with the padding showing uh, behind that steering wheel that's that adds a lot of texture to that shot. There is so much going on in this shot. The longer you look at it, the more you notice. Like I start noticing the yellow and black stripes up here on the visor. I notice the back of the mirror. Yeah, there's the headliner falling down. Yeah, you can sit here and look at this shot 
for a very long time and just keep noticing more and more new things. Yeah, I noticed like just now on this on the rear view mirror, there's like it looks like LM or yeah, something. Yeah, it says LM. Yeah. Like what the hell is that? Like I know it's a Lincoln, but it's a Continental, I think. So. Yeah, and it, if if you look at that little square right below the steering wheel, the little black square there on the on the fascia, that that looks like where the uh, windshield wiper blade used to be. Yep. That was my first thought. That's the first thing I saw. Done that wipers. Yep. 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 All right, pause. Melissa, you're not allowed to go to sleep. I saw you dozing. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm actually not sleeping. Thank you. Yeah, you were turned sideways with your eyes closed and your head back. I saw it. I'm not sleeping, I swear. <laughs> All right. When I when I go back to, I do want to get that full reflection of the sign. I'm going to try and figure out an angle to where get I can get the, the sign window. reflecting in the windshield. That would be Is, awesome. Are those stripes up there at the top of the windshield actually reflection of the sign or part of the yeah. visor? They're That's what I thought. I say. But That's they are reflection. The, uh, they are on the visor, though. So I don't know if it would actually reflect off the glass. I would imagine at certain times of day it would. Wow. Very cool, very cool. I definitely like it. Somebody sending me other messages. And this shot, I like this shot as well. I like the fact that you actually stepped back behind or to the side of the filling station and shot out when most people would be like, oh, let me shoot from the street or let me shoot from across the street back at the filling station, you know? Right. I, I yeah, like that you turned around and you shot out into the open desert, just getting the awning and the cafe sign and the pumps and, you know. Yeah, just to the right of the frame too, there were actually some uh, cars parked there that did not fit the time or place. So uh, that's actually why I did that too. I stepped back and just shot that that part of the uh just the two pumps the outermost two pumps gotcha of course i guess the gas prices kind of give away the uh time but <laughs> either way wow all right so i've got dave and jake y'all both sent me images on facebook i'll pull those up in just a moment yeah if, if you want to well of course i want to <laughs> I got. I gotta take. Uh, I, just, I gotta take a. I gotta take a shot at you. I need to beat on you a little bit. Hey, dude, yeah. do it. Do it. <laughs> so, so, so so minor, minor, minor or not technical. Said, mm -hmm. I don't know who it was because there's like there's actually more than a dozen people sitting in here, and I just didn't notice which one left. But whatever. Y'all have a good evening, whoever you were. Matt Cook left. Oh, Matt left. Matt, right. I'm not technical. I was just kind of showing that like wide angle on the cars. It's just such an interesting angle. Yeah, let me pull that up. Riding on cars. There we go. Oh, there. I love rat rod trucks. Yeah, I love those big white walls, too. Oh, that's what I sent you the other day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's hot stuff right there. Ooh. Cool. Oh, that's an Arkansas. Truck gang. <laughs> Is that a S2? No, that's a Miata, isn't it? It's a Miata. That's a Miata. Like nobody I used to get a car model so long ago. Well, it was in my twenties. That wasn't the only one you got, was it? No, I got them all. I'm just cycling through them. Oh, slowly. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. That was a bad. Uh, right angle. now, I'm sitting here appreciating this rat rod truck. Yeah. Do the right thing. Looks like a late forties, early fifties. Did it have the front clip on it, or was it fully exposed with just a radiator? It was a radiator. I have a photo of it, actually. Nice. Oh, that's uh, hold on. Oh, here, I'll send it to you. Um, oh, I don't want to take a photo. Fucking alcohol. <laughs> I'm glad I did shit. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty F100. Even though I'm a Chevy guy, I really appreciate the old Fords. And that's a good-looking F100. Yeah. The old Fords are the only Fords that I like. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, you don't get me wrong. I mean, the new, new, new Fords, they're pretty. But no, they're not. I, I don't like anything from like, <laughs> I don't like anything from like 2016 back to like 1980. 
<laughs> yeah, my problem with a lot of the Fords is they still have a gauge cluster in some of them that looks like it came out of my 91 Mercury Sable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, can't you update your shit by now? <laughs> that is a very interesting perspective on that. And no, none of these are edited. This was just okay. a uh, kind of a walk around. So yeah, it, it's amazing how people. exaggerated the 20 does this, especially with this front cowl right here. This, this is a 14. It really exaggerates it. That's cool. This is a 14. This isn't the twenty. Oh, okay, fourteen. Yeah, I was gonna say it's got to be wider than wider than a twenty. Uh, you'd be surprised. Depends on how close you get. Yeah, it's true too. Yeah. Is that a fourteen prime, Jacob? Like the yes, uh, like the Samyang or the Rokinon? Yeah, that's the uh, Rokinon uh, two point eight. Okay, I got that lens too. It's it's a nice lens. Very 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 good for the money. Yeah, that, that was how I started astrophotography, actually. Me too. <laughs> I think that lens oh. kicked off a lot of astrophotography careers. <laughs> right. Nice. At 20, I haven't shot any uh, cars between. That's 20. You're kind of breaking yeah, up there, Jacob. Are you moving around? Uh, no. Oh, it got really like twangy and metallic and choppy for a second. Oh no, I was just saying that twenty is freaking amazing. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. that's the, the uh, twenty fun, art fun of the amazing lens. Oh yeah, that's a that's a really cool truck. I'm not even mm -hmm. talking about the the photography aspect of it. That's just a really cool truck. Mm -hmm. I have a thing for the rat rods. The only thing I have a problem with, which is not Jacob's fault at all is when you shoot at places like this it's just like you get people's umbrellas or their chairs or whatever it is next to their car it's like yeah I, li I like seeing those cars in the wild it'd be cool if you could um you know get with some of these people to do a photo shoot and just have them park in some abandoned area right that'd be super cool oh here's a here's a really cool shot you you guys like I'll pull it up here in a minute. I've already jumped over onto David's. All right. I just oh, okay. also sent you the before. Yeah, I saw um, that. I'm going to pull that up in just a second. Cool. Cool, cool. Give us a little uh, a little intro on it, David. 2017, um, kind of an off day for me. Head was screwed up. This is uh, Cayman Brack, a uh, little diving beach resort on Cayman Brack. So I walked around with a Canon 1D and lens and shot a bunch of uh, just whatever I could see. This is right outside the dive shop on a peninsula that protected the dock that the dive boats all tied up to. And I just saw this, this thing is almost a drift tree. It's not just a piece of driftwood. Um, and I, I wanted to catch the ocean in the background, some of the clouds and uh, decided to try to take this one to HDR and bring some of the blues out, see what I could do with it. What, uh, what lens were you shooting this with? Mm, I have to think about that. I'm going to have to go look at the, uh, the meta file. There's very minimal editing done to this one, right? That's right. Okay. There's no editing done to this one, and then there was the HDR. Uh, with uh, essentially no cropping at all, just uh, some adjustment of color. Yeah, I mean, I, I see the cropping. Literally, all you clipped was just this one little bit of that root, that root right there. That's all the cropping you did. Yep. Um, one thing I did notice, though, is in your cropping, I know that this one, the horizon, is slightly skewed down to the yep. right. But in this one... You went too far, and it skewed slightly down to the left. So you well, didn't, you didn't it, it may be it, that you were trying to straighten it for level. Uh, it, it actually may be one of the shots before that. I I thought I was matching them up, yeah. but but I didn't. Um, could have been you know the same angle uh, for the camera, and I wasn't quite getting everything on level. Yeah. 
the cool shot. I'm not going to talk about the the HDR effect yet. Okay. There, there it is. Wise, what I would have liked to have seen for this shot is is if you had taken one nice wide step camera left. Okay. Okay. And then maybe drop down, squatted down, or drop to a knee. Right. So that you brought part of this up above the horizon so you don't have the horizon just clipping this little bit but you got a lot of this interest right up here in the sky you would have still gotten all of this cool turquoise water and everything but you would have had this going more this way right like this so it'd be going from corner to corner almost interesting made a better composition in my opinion doing that you know I was actually about to say the opposite of what Josh just said. Okay. <laughs> no, no, not in not in the because the the same thing that Josh is talking about with the horizon line going through part of the drift tree was also the first thing that caught my attention. So I might consider shooting a little wider angle and moving the camera up slightly. I was down on it. Yeah, to shoot, oh, okay. shoot a little more down. So your horizon line stays uh, flat and, and, and without interruption, but you can also just as easily go the other way, like Josh said. I think it's just that it's so much on the border, right? Mm -hmm. the yeah. way that it starts to become a little bit of a distraction. Yeah, it's just a weird place to, to intersect right here. It just, you know, it's just like when you're shooting people, you don't want the horizon running right through the middle of their head or even through their neck. You know, you, you got it. it down below the shoulders or even down, you know, the waist or whatever, you know, and you don't want to cut just right through the top of the head. You want to get them well below it. You don't want them butted up against the horizon and you don't want it cutting through an odd location on their body or, you know, so same thing with good. inanimate objects. You don't want to intersect it in an odd location <laughs> and you don't want it butting up really close to it. You want separation. Good. I like that. Yep, yep. As for the HDR, <laughs> I like the HDR on the driftwood itself because it brings out a lot of the color and the detail. What I might have done is maybe kind of stacked on the HDR processing and l did it like this here, but then backed it off a little bit on the water and then backed it off even more on the sky. And I feel that overall, it kind of darkened the image. This is nice and bright, right? And right. when I transfer to this, the sky is too dark. Okay. It, it, you, it's obvious that it's been darkened. So I, I, I might at least lighten up the sky. That will probably help a lot. But I honestly would back off on the HDR processing of the water as well. And if you're really trying to bring out the color, don't do it via HDR. Just do it via like vibrance or saturation because the HDR is making it really too crispy. Yeah. Water okay. isn't that crispy. Water is fluid. And this, since it's got all these little bright highlights in it, the HDR really makes it look really crunchy, really crispy for lack of a better term. Okay. You know? And there's actually a gradient tool that you can use to where you're only editing like, you know, the bottom half of the composition because the sky on the other, the non HDR is, is really realistic, but you could have brought more out, you know, from the bottom half of the photo and left the sky mostly or completely untouched. Yeah. And for Good. those who haven't noticed, we can actually see how much straightening David has done here because if you look down in this bottom corner, he straightened one layer and left the underlying layer so you can see. <laughs> right there. Uh, it needs a tighter crop. I, I didn't even catch that at first. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like to Jacob's point, like I think you could run a gradient for the bottom and the top, and maybe if you really wanted to boost a little bit of the blue tones in the sky. Something I like to do in clouds sometimes is I'll put a little bit of negative clarity on there. Yeah, it seems kind of counterintuitive, but uh, to soften them up a little bit. Yeah. 
then you could run another gradient on the bottom if you really wanted to boost up a little bit of shadow detail or also warm up the tones or you know, whatever it is you're going for. Good, thanks. Yep, yeah. Very cool, still a very cool image though. And definitely, especially since it's like vacation travel photography. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, there there were a lot of different scenes around there. There's there's some palm trees uh, flanking swimming pool, and you know all sorts of stuff that I did that that day with obvious with the trade winds blowing. Right. Um, but I I thought I'd throw this one up there and let you guys take a shot at it. Cool, cool. Yeah, I, I love the like color. It. Yeah, I do like it. And I do like how you kind of had a a leading line with the uh, drift tree coming from the lower left corner. I think that was really nice too. Jake, cool. this shot right, right here. What? And this <laughs> shot right here. What? These two shots are winners. Oh, that those are stellar. Yeah. I, I love the the first that they're detail shots, but second that they have that semi wide almost fish ink or fish eye perspective to them which just puts it right in your face i really like those shots i mean you filled the frame with just specific details and that perspective just adds to it and gives it interest those, those are definitely winter shots i'm paying attention to these because i've got this uh 67 Mustang that I've yet to actually sit my butt in the seat that uh, I bought. Yeah, you got Little Red. I forgot about that. I got a Little Red. Yeah, good for my you. Boy, just before we got on this, my boy sent me shots of uh, of the driver's door put back together with the window working properly and a new new door panel. And, yeah, it's uh, it's coming together really well. Nice. Good for the you. 67, is that when they started the Fastback? Uh, it, it, they they had to pass back, I think, in 66, but 67 is when they moved the vents up in front of the rear wheel. Oh, okay. um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stick one up here in a minute that Josh can throw up just for giggles. It, and it's just a, it's a cell phone shot, but it'll show you what 67 looks like. Okay. Hey, Jacob, what's up with the chains around the uh, rear differential? Is that an homage to American Graffiti? Or do they just not want something to get stolen? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good question. They they, they actually had a uh, a matching trailer. Um, I don't think I well hold on. I don't know if I have a shot of it. They had a matching trailer and in the chain you know linkage for the trailer um, with that yellow. Oh, nice. Okay. I just I kept thinking about American Graffiti when they uh, chained up the uh, rear axle of the cop car. <laughs> yeah. You know, that actually happened in small town America in a lot of places that people don't know about. Oh, I believe it. If, if I was around at that time, I would have been with my friends doing that stuff. <laughs> they did that oh. to a cop, cop car in downtown Marlton, Arkansas in about 67. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Got the guy sleeping under a street light at about 2 in the morning and chained him to the to the pole. <laughs> All right, Melissa. All right, you're awake. Cool. I've been awake. I know, but you keep like relaxing and yeah, it's all good. Give us a little, uh, give us a little intro, uh, Melissa. Uh, I went to New Hampshire a month ago. Um, we hiked about 2,000 feet elevation to get to this point. Um, I took a picture with my 24 to 105. I'm not a landscape photographer, um, so COVID made me stretch my boundaries a little bit, mm -hmm. and I liked how this came out. And yeah, that's about it. That I use 24 to 105. Um, I don't even know my own settings because I'm a so garbage bad. person. Um, no, I was so at one over one. Oh, I actually use my 24 millimeter. I lied. <laughs> one over 100. I still speed 100. F13. <laughs> I just got to say it's refreshing to hear Melissa say I'm not a landscape photographer because I'm always the one that's in here saying, no, I'm not a portrait photographer. <laughs> no, I'm, only, I'm with you, Thomas. <laughs> I'm not a photographer. <laughs> Everybody wants that's just to what I was going to say. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I'm not a photographer either. I, 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 I shot Melissa. I do. Um, yeah. I think it's really cool that you've got this foreground of just the smooth rolling granite going down the mountain right here that then just kind of feeds into the dense vegetation and the trees and then it falls off into a valley and then you've got all of these different layers of mountains in the background and each layer has a little bit has an extra layer of atmospheric haze to it on each layer it just builds so much depth into this image and then you've got so much interest in the background, including like the snow-capped mountains back out there in the far distance. Yeah, that's Mount so Washington. Up into the sky. Um, the sky, I have one thing that kind of annoys me, and I don't know if it's part of the post-processing or if this was actually, I don't know, there's something weird. It was near that. sunset, um, so that's just the time of day, really. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah, something I think, right there that almost looks repetitive, almost like cloning or trying to... I it's not cloned at all, I swear. No, I, I believe you. I'm just saying that's the way it appears. It, it, it It's weird looking. But. Did you use Lightroom for this? Is this no, I it? use Photoshop only. Photoshop, okay. Um, I, I really... Uh, I appreciate, like, all the green tones towards the foreground of the trees, and I don't think that they're that unrealistic because I know... Um, things can be that green uh, in the forest. Mm -hmm. Over where Josh was talking about the cloning on the left part of the sky, there's some kind of odd green tones happening right above the mountains in the clouds that yeah. I'm getting. Um, I don't know what's up with that, but I would maybe consider slightly changing the color balance. Um, yeah, that was the color grading for sure, that green. Okay. Let's do the... Oh, damn it. Again, uh, a gradient tool would help. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here's another thing that you may want to consider is just the overall white balance. But instead of doing it, since I don't have the raw to play with the white balance, and I hate playing with white balance unless I'm working on the raw, I'm going to do this <laughs> with a color balance layer. Let's go ahead and just open it. I don't want to do that. All right, so let's fill that up. And let's do a color balance, and let's warm it up a little bit, because I think adding a little bit of warmth to it I edit give us so a whole cold. different you know? You're so cold-hearted. <laughs> so cold. What the hell? I don't edit anything warm ever. It's a really bad I know idea. you don't. And honestly, it's kind of a judgment call because I can go either way on this, but um, maybe a tiny bit of dehaze to take out the a little bit of the haze in the mountains, but it's oh, also I just, something... Oh, I disagree with that. I right, definitely it's, disagree with that. It, it can all, that's why I say it's a judgment call because it can also be something that adds to the image. It's kind of a artistic choice, really. Oh, I love the haze going back. I, I, I would... I would rotate it clockwise just a hair so that tree that's pronounced in the sky is straight and then kind of crop out um, kind of down to where that tree on the right side isn't in the composition because you can still keep, you know, that smooth, you know, uh, rocky ground and then going out to the mountains and you don't have that uh, I guess kind of like candid feel of that, that tree that's kind of half out of the frame. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I mean, again, judgment. I mean, that's... Yeah, I kind of agree with Jacob on that. I do think the tree on the right side maybe is a little bit distracting. Um, and this kind of going back to the beach uh, shot we just looked at, from I think it was David, yeah, uh, where we had like the horizon line and we were kind of nitpicking that a little bit uh, with the uh, with the tree. This one it doesn't bug me as much because the tree is so much higher than the horizon line. Yeah, I see that perspective. Overall, that's a that's a very nice shot. I mean that. Uh, that's definitely wall uh, frame category to me. 
I like the outdoors. I like the the mountain scenery like that. And it it's got a lot going on. You you just have to study it. And I see that haze in the background by the tree to the left. Um, I think it really adds quite an element to the to the shot. Yeah, Could you ma was... imagine this on a, a canvas on your wall? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I really can. And this is one of those things too, like Melissa, you said you're on a hike. I don't know if you were by yourself or with friends. But... No, we went on a trip and I just brought my camera. Um... Okay. So, I mean, this might actually be a cool thing just to like, print out, you know, maybe all or something, so, but uh, print it out small and just kind of give it to your friends in remembrance of that time that you had together, too, because it is. Yeah, no, good. that's a really good idea. Um, you know, it, it was, with COVID and all, it's really hard for me to find people to take pictures of, so just for creative sakes, I just went out and brought my camera with me on the hikes we go on. Mm, COVID. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> I think in a couple of years we'll all look at look back at COVID and have a lot of horror stories about that. <laughs> you could be so like just me and live best like years normal. of my life, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, oh, no. I, I already figure 2020 is lost, and I'm betting at least half of 2021 is gone too. Well, most most of us will have the years. Introverts right now sitting in their mom's basement going, "What's everybody bitching about?" Yeah, most I, of us. I, I, most I'm, of I'm, us will have the ears sticking out like Dumbo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty extreme introvert too. You guys probably wouldn't know it because I've got a few glasses of wine in me now. But, uh, <laughs> but but honestly, it's like having to go to work every day. It forces me to be a little bit of an extrovert, and I'm just like, man, it's just getting crazy. I think 2020 is crazy. an awesome year. This, this year has has actually turned out really great for me. So, so as everything hey. crumbles, life hey, is Melissa. going yeah. great. Hey, you know, you shot this at 24, right? Uh, hold on, let me double check. Uh, 24 to 105. No, 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 you said you used the prime. No, I didn't, I lied, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I think she said 24. I think you're gonna lie to me. You're on the you're on the, the focal length was 24 millimeters. So you were all the way down at 24. Yes. Yeah, my my driftwood shot was at 35 millimeter. So, so I was I was fixing yes, the same. So I was at 24 35? millimeters, but I wasn't using a prime. So what I was going to say is that 35 that you're considering would have captured that tree on the right and that whole horizon and everything else so immaculately. No, she she shot it at twenty four. I know, but she's considering buying a, a thirty five. Oh wow! Yeah. So so at a, a perspective level, or whatever. Like you you or I'm sorry, I'm saying that wrong. You would have, um, you would have cut the tree out, and had that horizon line, um, just set like perfectly. At at 35 she would have been just about tree to tree right right half right side of tree to left side of tree for the two tallest ones this 24 i, I think it's it was really really good selection yeah and see she could have used the uh, um rule of thirds put that left tree into the rule of thirds and had that right tree she may have had to crop it out a little bit to where it looked like a bush almost but she would have got that depth into the mountains and the sky and the if rock anybody knows me i'm a 24 millimeter queen <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, like everything she posts 24 yeah 24 oh by I, the way 24. I, I used to have the canon 24 to 105 on my 6d and that was like kind of the same thing with me it was like i might Wide open I might as well have just had a prime because it was like everything I was shooting was 24. Like I didn't even know there was another focal. Well, I have a 24 prime that I use for portrait, and it's like the most rebellious thing I've done in my life. I was like, you know, I'm supposed to use this for landscapes, but I think I can make this work for portraits too. I, I so. like the 24 for portraits. You, you know, I actually I bought the 24 before I bought the 35 for portraits, but. I, the 24 kind of took a back seat once I got the 35 because 
I, I actually really, really love the 35 for portraits now. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm considering buying the 35 and 40 for portraits next. If you get the 35 for portraits, it's, uh, I've, you know, it's, it's probably like one of the best environmental portrait lenses to take because I shoot a lot outdoors. I don't, but when I was in the gym taking images with it, I was like, you know what? I actually prefer taking it with the 35 than with the 50 or the 24. Well, the thing is because you're so far away. Like for me, I'm really close when I shoot people. I like being like here, you know, like I have a space issue. Um, so. <laughs> Well, I like to take it, um, the 35, I like taking close-ups too. Uh, the 24, I, I don't mind 24s to elongate and, and to get um, to get distortion, perspective distortion. So I don't mind using that. To really... I love perspective distortion more than I can tell you. It's so fun. <laughs> well, which is, why, which is why I was saying, like, maybe the 35 wasn't the best. However, I think the 35 you're going to be insanely happy with. I hope you get it. I want to see what you do with it. I yeah. want it. I might buy it because I have to take my camera to get a sensor cleaning anyway. So when I'm there, I might just end up trying it and be like, hey, I kind of need this. <laughs> you should have have I know value. <laughs> but the thing is, I want to get an 85 millimeter, but the problem is I don't ever shoot far away from people. So I feel like it's just going to end up sitting in my bag, you know? You should get like the 46 macro and use it for portraits. No, consider... <laughs> no don't. No. You should get the uh, 24 to 70. Don't listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, macro, macro lenses are the best portrait lenses. They are. You don't I, I use them using... for macro. You don't get right on top of your subject. You still pull back. Macro just means you can close focus. Doesn't mean yeah. you have to. So just 45 prime but, macro? But macro comes with some very interesting in-between focal lengths. Mm. Can you send me a link, Josh? Yeah, I don't know if they make it for Canon, but I'll look. I'm All sure right. that they make a 40-something macro for the Canon. Are you or on you... Canon EF or you're on Canon whatever the new one is, the EOS? Uh, the nice thing about the Canon R is I have the adapter, so I can use EF. Um, so you're, you're shooting an R? Okay. I'm shooting an R, yeah. Okay. I made yeah. the upgrade this past Oh, look, y'all can be R buddies. Well, no, I was going to say, because I'm Sony now, so if you want an 85-1.8 Canon, um, I'd be happy to sell it to you pretty cheap as soon as I get my 85 Sony. Sure. Let me know. I think they're like 350 new. I don't know. I'd let it go for a lot less than that. Okay. Yeah. I'll okay. better mow you. Is amazing too. I don't I know. I have an 85 G Master. Master. I slightly cropped this, Melissa. I mean, literally like two or three percent from, from the bottom well, left corner. Well, we've been been bantering back and forth. He's been busily working on that that shot. Well, I was listening to all y'all too and just playing with things. Yeah. Letting y'all do your thing. So I mean, I literally just like two or three percent. I I brought it into this tree right here, just to kind of get. I don't know. It felt just slightly off balance to me, so I brought it in from this side and from this bottom because I didn't want to lose any of the sky. Mm -hmm. Then I went in and started doing some color grading. So I took it from this cool blue, and I took down the saturation of the green because the green just feels oversaturated to me, no matter how lush it was, you know. Yeah. And then I added some warmth to it just to give it like that afternoon sun warmth, you know? Yeah. And I did that with quite a few layers, actually. I did it with a, with a um, camera raw filter. I did it with a color balance. I did it with, <laughs> I mean, I really stacked a bunch of stuff into that to get that, that color grade. But is that, is that the final? Go back to that. That's the original. That's all three added to it. Okay. Um, and I didn't address the, the weird ectoplasmic thing going on over here. I was just going to say, I'm still seeing a little bit yeah, of no, I, I, I didn't address that. I just okay. left it. Ectoplasm was there. Slimer was there and sprayed ectoplasma. Like right here, these, this little group of clouds right here above this ridge line to, to the left of this tree. This it's like oh, it's got a weird like green 
something going on right here. Oh, there was right, a bunch, right, of, right, right, right. A bunch of stoners over there just, you know, <laughs> smoking it up. And... The chronic, to, to quote uh, Frono's photo, um, you've also got a little bit of glowy McGlowerson going on around the trees. Too. Yeah, a little bit. Just a tiny bit. It's not that noticeable. Most people wouldn't see it. It's still a really great landscape shot, especially for a I'm not a landscape photographer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I am definitely more of a portrait person. For sure. Like I said, I, I love I love the composition with the foreground of the smooth rolling steps of the granite right here that takes up the foreground. And then you've got a couple trees to break it up, and then it falls off into this lush forest that then falls off into this valley, that then comes into this ridge, that then goes into that ridge, and then that ridge. And I mean, it just stack after stack after stack after stack. And each one gets further out into that atmospheric haze. So it just creates almost an infinite depth to this image. And that I really like. Hi, David. Oh no, not me. Stephen oh. just bowed out. Uh, oh, Jacob? Left. No, Stephen left. Oh, okay. Nope. I'll be I'm here for a little bit. Around, I guess. I'm wide awake for once. Usually I'm the granny and I leave at like 12. You know, on this shot too, I, I don't leave. know. Do you want me to With, you um, want me leave? Oh. <laughs> it would have been. Let's talk, Jake. <laughs> It would have been kind of curious. I don't. I don't know what the composition would have looked like because you would have had the the tree on the left much more center frame. But if you could have got maybe in front of the tree that's on the right, and then shot a little bit to the left, I think that could have been interesting. Mm -hmm. Or to put that tree that's on the left over to the extreme left. Um, yeah, that, that could be interesting too. Yeah. But again, you know, I wasn't there, so it's it's hard to, you know, say where you could Well, this was on a steep decline, so it was like limited uh, limited mobility when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, you know what you honestly should have done? You should have climbed the tree on the right. And I then to the you guys can kiss my ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Score from Eliza. <laughs> My camera is not worth the risk. <laughs> ah, okay. So just the camera. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about my phone. Quiet. Hey, don't don't worry about that. <laughs> I, I had the a wave crash into my camera bag with all my lenses in there. Oh, damn it, John! I forgot to tell you. All right, so you're the only one that I told you about leaving the top off the Jeep and completely soaking all of my gear, right? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I left the top off the Jeep, and we had a bunch of thunderstorms come through a week ago or whenever, and I completely forgot. And I had all of my camera gear in the back seat of the Jeep. Ooh. Where do you live where you can keep all of your camera gear in the back seat of an unsecured jeep with no top on it anywhere arkansas like, well, well welcome to arkansas or around <laughs> the great lakes i can't even keep a pair of ray-bans on my dashboard in california without having to lock the doors <laughs> oh yeah i don't leave anything in my truck even even in san clemente nope <laughs> but um okay so i left the top off i had everything sitting there you know i came out the next morning and it's like downpouring i'm like and I knew, uh, you know, most everything is in like Pelican cases, so that didn't bother me. But I knew that I had left like my canvas, you know, backpack that had backpack. an 810, a 750, and several lenses in it, right? Not only did I leave it there, I had forgotten that I had actually opened it up and I was looking for something and I left it open. Ooh. Oh, no. oh, when I went and looked in it, there was literally a puddle of water inside the backpack and everything sitting in the puddle of water. I'm just like, hmm. Paging Nikon professional services. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't too worried about it because that, I that weather. merged all of them in like rivers and stuff and never had a problem. Okay. But what I was going to say, John, is come to find out there is some damage. My 810 
the one that was submerged, it will not power on with just the single battery in it. But if I attach the extended battery grip to it, it will power on. <laughs> oh, that's nice. My my um my fifty works now. It works oh, with no it problem. Dried out enough to where it works. Yeah, it works with no issues. All the G Master lenses worked. So yeah. what, once that one inch of water is sitting in the backpack and the Pro Photo um, B10 Plus works. Yeah. Um, the the only thing that doesn't work is the 105. Um, so I did the insurance claim and I'm mailing it off to I mailed it off to Sigma today. Yeah. So they could go in there, but I mean, I if I wanted to just manual focus and keep the the 105 wide open, I could do that. But yeah, Sigma but, even their art series are not completely weather sealed. I forgot the terminology that used, but basically it's resistant, not proof or weather sealed. So you know you can't submerge it, but it'll hold up to you standing out in the rain shooting. But yeah. you don't want to hold it under the water. You, know? yeah. you, can just, you can dunk it under the water for about a quarter of a second, and then you better pick it back up. So, right. Well, <laughs> well, all my, all, I had, I had the the twenty four, the fifty, the eighty five, one thirty five, and the one hundred five in there, and the wave crashed into the bag, and everything got soaking wet and probably about one inch of water that was sitting in there and the and the b10 was in there and so you know it took me a a second or two to get over the shock of the wave crashing in there to finally <laughs> dump everything out and and then of course you know because then i got home you know i wiped everything off and <clears throat> all the lenses were working except for the 50 and the and the 105 so after two days, two or three days, the 50 started working with no issues. Like, like it just performs. But the 105 still doesn't work. So it, it kind of had me, since I do a lot of beach stuff, I go out into things, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that, that the Sigma says, hey, it's a total loss and I can just get money for it. Because I don't, I don't really use the 105 much. Because, you know, I got the 85, and I got the 135. So I'm just hoping that they tell me it's a complete loss, which I doubt there are. They're gonna probably tell me that they took the little adapter off, put the new adapter on, and then I'll still have the 105. Uh, Lisa, Lisa left, and I was just about to ask her something. Oh uh, yeah, she just left. So, yep. But, but are you worried? Now, uh, mold or anything like that growing inside the lens? No, no. It, it, if water got into the lens itself, into the elements, then uh, they they would all have been devastated. But I don't, I don't think. I, uh, I think what what happened was with the the contacts on the fifty, with with the um, had to get dried out on the interior or on the on the interior of the contacts. And once it dried out, it was able to function. Uh, the G Master lenses, th those things are so weather sealed. I mean, I had water actually crash onto my camera with with the lens on, soaking wet, and and they and kept on doing shoots with it. So, um, but now I, I don't. I just don't. I'm not going to buy anything that's Sigma. Or anything because I'm rough on my gear. I'm the type of guy that would throw my lens onto the ground in the sand <laughs> and not care. Uh, that's how I am. I mean, you I'm the my total ball. opposite. I'm so dainty. Like I'm like, well, yeah, Melissa. I'm like you. Whenever you start buying pro gear, you're buying pro gear for it to be rugged. That's right. And if you're serious, I mean, insurance is not expensive and i mean a lot of things include insurance i mean if you're a ppa member you're you've got a hundred thousand dollars worth of insurance coverage you know or you can buy gear insurance for relatively cheap per year you know and case in point something like this the cost of his insurance is nothing compared to replacing that 105. yeah you yeah know? the 105 is 1800 bucks yep and the insurance, 
even my homeowner's insurance will cover me for a lot of that stuff. Yep. Uh, I made sure about all that. Yeah, um, so it, it, it's good to have insurance uh, on your, even if you, even if you're, you coddle it, it's good to have it. I mean, I'm just one of these people, I don't coddle my gear because yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 if I spend the money on it and, and it, it needs to perform, like like how it should be, and and you know, uh, you know, as we go out and travel and we we go and shoot and do these things, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Like you could have been taking that landscape, uh, a uh, uh, billy goat could have came running up, and you could have knocked over something or you could have dropped your camera. You never know. Cause I, I know a lot of people who drops their gear. I, I wear a wrist strap with mine. I don't, I don't wear a neck strap with my camera, but I know people who, who drop their camera, bang their lens and their elements doesn't work no more and won't focus or anything. So anything can happen. Even though you try baby and pamper your gear, it's always good to have that coverage just in case. Yeah, I'm thinking of switching to a wrist strap for just that reason. The neck strap kind of annoys me. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily tough on my camera gear. I would say I, I try and protect it as much I can, as much as I can, but I'm also not afraid to put it in uh, pretty uh, potentially bad situations. Like I'll throw my A7R3 on a tripod and stick it in the Pacific Ocean and, uh, you know, try and do a long exposure shot of a pier. Like I would say my tripod takes most of the abuse, Tom, but look I'm, it, not, look I'm not afraid to do it with the camera either. Yeah. Yeah. Josh yeah. and I have similar, similar setups. Mine's probably different, different than his, but there's my wrist strap. Yeah, I honestly, I think wrist strap is the way to go. Neck straps kind of annoy me. What I do, yeah. since I'm a cheap bastard, is I take my neck strap and I actually wrap it around my wrist three times. Yeah. <laughs> this is the spider. So, okay. literally just a back of the hand strap, but it's ergonomic. I love that. I use oh, yeah. You can just let your hand hang down, down, the camera hangs off of it, and then when you need it, you just grab it. I know what you're I've talking about, except that I usually keep a spider plate on the bottom, so I have a yep. a belt latch that it just locks into, so okay. I don't have it hanging off of my wrist. So if I want to have my hand free, I just Probably click it into my it belt, in. and then my hand's free. I don't have it dangling off my wrist. I like the spider. Yeah. I've got one of those. Yeah, I got to look into all that stuff, because especially for me when I do, uh, if I'm doing like long exposure stuff, uh, the next strap becomes a big problem when I have the camera mounted on a tripod and I'm in like yeah. a windy situation. I have to stand there and like hold the neck strap up so I'm not getting any body shake while I'm yep. doing. It. All right, so Thomas, this is the belt clip for the spider. Okay. This is the plate for the spider, and it literally just goes in uh -huh. and it hangs off your belt. Oh, interesting. So you've got your camera hanging off your belt, right? And then whenever you're ready, you just grab your camera and you're ready to go. And you still use you that actually in use the lock right here. So if <coughs> in place you lock it in, then it won't it won't come off of that at all, no matter what direction it is. And the only okay. way to get it to release is you pull the little release and then you go. I never keep that locked. I always just leave it so I can just slide it in and out. But okay. I have that and then the hand strap. So I've got the hand strap to secure it while I've got it in my hand. But then when I need my hand free, I just reach down, click it onto my waist. It's that fast and my hand's free. All right. You know? Is there still a screw on the bottom available to do like yes. an Arca Swiss plate it actually, or an It actually bracket? gives you a couple of different ones. Okay. You can put several different, yeah. All right, interesting. I'm gonna have to look into that. Cause I do like an L bracket sometimes, but I, you know, yeah. if not an L bracket, I, actually, I like the Arca. I actually usually keep an Arca on the bottom of that spider plate just so I can slap it on a tripod if I want. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I have mine made. Um, this guy, he, he's he's stationed at Fort Campbell. He 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 made me he made mine out of five fifty cord. So mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, oh, nice. And, uh, and stuff. So and then he put the um, you know, the little. 
I forgot who those peak design. Oh, yeah. you, you just have a slip. It's not actually uh, – it doesn't hold your hand to it. It's just a slip around your wrist. Yeah, it just slips around my yeah. wrist and and stuff. And like I said, I, I damaged my gear. I got oh, yeah. I got cut. I got all oh, marks all over my my lens or right here in the front because well that's what happens when you shoot in the desert a lot. <laughs> and, and, and so and there's a spider. If you can see that, there's a spider grip. Uh, you know, okay. wrist strap, and it's and it's got the wrist retainer strap with it. I can't lose that one D. This it, one comes with the wrist retainer yep. strap. I just took it off because I don't like it. Okay. Yeah, yeah I got to look uh, into all that there you stuff, go, John. I'm, I'm getting tired of neck straps. When you, when yeah, you well, all this kind of wear. <laughs> yeah. I was I was hideously tired of neck straps, so it, it, you know it, it weights your arm down a little bit, but it keeps the camera at ready. I will tell you or, what I do have a black magic sling that goes across, and I do like that. I just don't like the neck strap itself where it goes around the neck. I like the strap across where it's draped across the shoulder and across your body. And that sling puts the camera right down at, you know, extended arm's length. So my camera's always at my hip, and I can just pull it up when I have that uh, sling on. You know, it doesn't, like that. That's, it doesn't happen that often, but sometimes I do cover events. Like there's a yearly, Orange County, there's a yearly uh, music uh, industry event that I cover. Yeah. And usually for that, I'll carry two bodies. And so it would be nice to have like one on a neck strap and then another body on a wrist strap. Uh, so I can no, you put them, more easily. You put them both on slings. Put them both on slings and put one on each hip. Yep. That's the way I do it when I carry two. It's really handy. I could, I, right, you're well, kind of robotic there, but you were saying carry two. So I am going to wrap this up. Okay. Yep, yeah. So I appreciate you all coming on.